Hey lovely people! So today is a very interesting video because it isn't pop culture so to speak but it does intersect with a lot of my interests about you know media, portrayals of blackness, black womanhood etc and black arts. And so today I'm here to talk to you about the Jeremy O'Harris Broadway play Slave Play. I wrote a piece about it for the Mary Sue and I was offered tickets so I want to be upfront about that so y'all know I don't got Slave Play money like that but I did get an opportunity to go see it because of, of press related reasons and I had seen posters of it on the subway because I do live in New York City and I saw uh, Kimberly Foster from For Harriet's video going over the play and so I was hearing a lot of different things about it and so I was glad I got the opportunity to see it and judge it for myself and I will say that from when I initially watched it to now I still find myself trying to honestly decide how I feel about it. I think that it's very layered, I think it's very interesting, and I think that a lot of people have been questioning, is this a play for black people or is it for a white audience? And I think the thing that we sometimes forget is that when anything enters the mainstream it will have a blended audience, it will have a mixture of black and white people seeing it, but I think what people are asking, is it there to teach white people about racism or is it there to speak something truthful through art to black people? Slave play falls in a happy medium. It definitely is an educational tool in a lot of ways, but I do think that at the core of the show it is about verbalizing and you know dramatizing sort of the anxieties and issues that can come if you are a black person or to an extension a brown person who navigates a lot of um, predominantly white institutions, has a very blended group of friends, especially white friends, and who has had um, white partners and I think a lot of those elements kind of come together about how you will feel about slave play. Let's get into it together. First of all thank you to my patrons, you guys have been so great, hope you've been enjoying this early access content and everything else. Um, we have a good time, we have a couple more videos that are going to be up this month because even though I'm late I like to catch up and again if you want to see what I'm doing follow me on Twitter, Instagram, all that jazz. Um, some exciting things are going to be happening in the next couple of months. Um, I'm sure some of you have kn known that like I'm working with Lindsay Ellis on a bunch of project stuff so things are going well things are exciting and so that's why my intake is a little bit slower plus revising that book y'all I'm gonna try and turn that into content for the patreon for the five dollar people um, but uh, if my input is a little bit like with this long break it's because I was doing a lot of catching up traveling etc but we're here we're doing it Slave Play. Slave Play is an original piece by Jeremy O'Harris. He is a queer black man from Virginia. He graduated from Yale with an MFA. He's very sort of like uh, one of the up-and-coming great talents of Broadway. And what Slave Play is, uh, it's about three interracial couples. The main one which is a black woman and a white partner who is British, a uh, white man and a black man, and a white woman and a black uh, kind of implied to be mixed race uh, black man and sort of them going into this antebellum sexual therapy to kind of unpack why their sexual relationship has stagnated um, throughout the course of their relationship. It's it's one long show, it's uh, over two hours, but it kind of has like three sections. The first section is seeing all of the characters in the slave play. So you have sort of like the poor white, you know, overseer with the black woman. You have the, you know, the plantation mistress and the mulatto slave boy. And then you have sort of like um, the indentured white servant and the like black overseer type. So those three are playing off each other in the first part, dealing with kind of like the sexual middle view that's going on there. Um, the middle part is about the therapy unpacking all of the relationships and the third part focuses on the black uh, female character and her white partner. Their names are, let me consult my playbill, uh, Kanisha and Jim. Jim, yeah, <laughs> very pointed name. 
My initial reaction to slave play was that a lot of it made, did make me very uncomfortable. I think it was hard to watch some of the slavery um, interactions. Jeremy Harris is a black American man, so you know he has every right to tap into that as a way of communicating art. I don't think it was an issue of authenticity in terms of like the framing of it, but I think it is sort of hard to see. And the hardest parts for me were the scenes with the with Kanisha and Jim. Overall, there was something that was lacking in that dynamic more than the other two that kind of made it a little bit hard for me to watch. And while I didn't hate it, it did draw discomfort from me, which is intentional. The entire uh, set is, a, is like has mirrors so that you're always kind of interacting with the stage. I was very up close, um, so I got to see it really well. And I... It drew a lot of emotions out of me that I was unprepared for because I think I came into it very cynical because um, uh, Kim from For Harriet didn't really care for it, which I understood. I think her perspective was very refreshing. I'm glad I watched her video before I went in because it prepared me for certain aspects that were uncomfortable. I think that the most poignant part of the show is the therapy section. I think that that section really unpacks a lot of dynamics that I think are very interesting. And a lot of that actually focuses on the relationship between the two gay men. And I think that, you know, when you're drawing from your own experiences, I think that Jeremy O. Harrison is previous where he kind of deals with like unpacking sort of like interracial black white relationships. So I think that that part was very tight. It was very, um, there was a lot of truth that I could find out of it. The lesbian couple that frames it, they, I felt a lot of truth in their relationship as well. Um, they played off each other re really well and I like that dynamic. And I think that the, uh, the Philip character, who is the mixed race black man, even though he didn't speak a lot, the points that he did come up and have about his dynamic with his wife, um, his white wife, were very interesting. But honestly, I think when I was trying to unpack why the Kanisha Jim part didn't work for me, while O'Harris is a very talented um, creator, I kind of walked out of it thinking, you've never been called a bed wench to your face and it shows. There is something that is very specific to the black female experience and how we date and who we date and how that all intersects. So what did I like about Slave Play? I think what I liked the most about it was the therapy sections. I think the therapy, I like seeing black people in therapy, period. I like the idea of discussing how uh, an interracial relationship can be very emotionally complicated without sort of the overwhelming gravitas of say like that article that was like I talk to a robot because I can't talk to my partner about race. It was more dealing with how white partners, even the most well-meaning of them, and I would even argue any non-black partner and even within you know black partners it can get even more you know breakdown. Sometimes your narrative is not believed or or they themselves think that they have done the work of unpacking their racism because they're with you and they try to seem open but when confrontation happens they instantly begin to plateau their feelings over yours or try to shame you because they can never win and I thought that was really interesting because that honestly felt very true when sometimes when you're trying to talk to a white person whether it be your friend your partner anything there is sort of this feeling of like they're they already know that they're not racist so they just find your comments and your critique of them to be an attack on their goodness rather than you just expressing like hey like this is an issue the therapy portion really showed how the white male partner felt like he was above it and there's a whole portion where he's like i'm not white but he doesn't ever say what he is and i think that was very poignant um because it's something that I had seen in my own life and seen with other, like some of my um, gay male friends who are black who have dated, you know, white men. Them wanting to do well, trying and doing the work, but how complicated it can be to, to meet each other fully in certain conversations. I think fundamentally I will appreciate that slave play, that slave play brought this story to a white audience because I, I when I saw Slave Play I was surrounded by old white people as you know every as I'm sure most black people who saw the show were the, the people who want to create the art that has these conversations they should do so that we don't have to. I ordered four copies of Slave Play because there were sections that I really loved and I wanted to just 
take those, highlight them, and when I feel like I'm in a mood, I'll just be like, here, Slave Play did the work. I don't have to talk to you about this. And I think that's refreshing. There are people who want to create the dialogue, who do want to create conversation, who do want to communicate to whiteness and be that bridge. And I think that, like, since we don't all, as individual black people, want to do that labor all the time, it's good that someone does want to do it. What I thought was missing from Slave Play, okay, so there's... Um, so there's kind of this trope in social media about the loving v Virginia crowd. Basically it's kind of like a, a way of like shading interracial couples that are really into being an interracial couple and like really use it for clout. The way that interracial relationships are kind of, you know, talked about in media is very split for different reasons. The black male white woman dynamic is very different than the white man black woman dynamic and I think that and I'm speaking to the black women that like I know that are that are know their history, are fully competent in themselves, who are not dating interracially because they want to grab onto whiteness, but because they are looking for partnerships. But I think that there was something really missing from what it's like to date as a black woman. What it's like to have your relationships and your relationship choices heavily scrutinized by every aspect of the media within your community. Because black women through ch chattel slavery, both, you know, in Amer in the Americas and in the Caribbean, because uh, the status of the child was passed through the mother, there is sort of this perpetual burden that black women carry of being the carriers of the race, of, of, of raising black children even when the there is no father around, whether they be white, black, etc. Of really cultivating blackness in our, in our youth. That is put on us. But in general, I, I don't think that most sensible black women choose a white partner to either mute their blackness or to mute the blackness of their children but more so because they are looking they, they find someone who treats them in a certain kind of way that they had not been treated before and I don't even mean that in a racialized way I just mean like you're looking for a partnership I know so many black women who you know, their ideal partner was always another black man. And that just never happened for them. And I remember when I went to college, I had a crush on this guy, this other black guy, he was Haitian, he was so cute, he had like really great, he dresses well, cause you know they do that, Haitians, Haitians be dressing. I remember we were in the library and I heard him talking with a bunch of other uh, black men, all of them who I was chilled with and I was friends with, and they were talking about how like their ideal woman was like Eva Longoria, or like, you know, the very like um, Hollywood Latinx that you usually see in media, you're even Lagoria, there's Jennifer Lopez, and it was very much telling me that even in this environment that was predominantly white, that was, you know, a place where you would think that we would all kind of come together, that we were still really hungry for the same kind of woman. Like, it's always lighter skinned women, always Latina women. Like, it was all of this pushing aside of other black women to uplift non black women. Kanisha needs Jim to admit that he is not above it. Basically Jim, because he's British and he's white, he's like, she's my queen, which made me like literally gag in my throat. She needs him to accept that despite being British, despite being woke, despite all these kind of things, that his whiteness still connects him to slavery, still connects him to the institutions of whiteness and patriarchy that, you know, subjugate her even to this day, which I get. The part that I can't connect to is why that needs to manifest itself in slave play. That is a level that I could not even fathom. And I think to a degree, I find it frustrating because as a black woman who has had a white partner, outwardly like my boyfriend for a long time was white, I think he was on one of these videos one time, but like I remember at least three different occasions having a black man come up to me, us, while we were together and like call me a bed wench and compare our relationship to slavery. Because it's my experience and because as a descendant of slaves through the Caribbean and other stuff probably, I find it deeply uncomfortable that an educated an educated, thoughtful black woman who's a writer and has all of these different things cannot communicate this issue. Sometimes I, sometimes like, I think about the fact that like 
like in the Caribbean, for, especially in slavery, like the the fertility rates were so much lower than in, than in the continental Americas, and the mortality rates were so high, the the rates of suicide were so high, and sometimes I would think about that and think about like I am here because generations of women survived that through rape, through beatings, through torture, through inhumane conditions of having their wombs be, you know, incubators for profit. That it's just not something that I would feel comfortable even playing around with. Does it mean that I think that you can't discuss slavery, the relationship between like slaves and um, the rape relationships between slaves and masters or even like the consensual relationships because I know that's a whole topic that also comes up. You can discuss that. But I think that when you, f not flippantly, but I think it needs to be handled carefully. Because just the other day, the, um, I think her name is Jodie Smith. She's the actress who was in, who played Queen and Queen and Slim. She just literally got called a bed wench for being married and pregnant with Joshua Jackson's baby. She got called a bed wench. And this is a dark-skinned black woman. And I can tell you, I've spoken to so many dark-skinned black women who have said like, they go on Tinder and they're looking for black men and they don't swipe with them. But if they, as soon as they swipe on a, ma a white man with a beard, they get a match. So that's their experience. It doesn't mean that they're not searching for black men. It doesn't mean that they're not looking for black men. But like, if someone out there is, wants to love you and you guys meet in a mutual way, why are you gonna deny yourself that love? This is what Slave Play brought out in me, these, these thoughts about what it means to, what, what it means to be a black woman dating, what it means to be a, a sexual black woman, what it means to be a black woman who is in different relationship spaces. And I think what's really important, I think what's really important about what the play did is that it created an avenue for me to think about these things that I was kind of not expecting. There's a scene where uh, the character Gary is telling their boyfriend Dustin, great names, his, what made Gary really feel attracted to Dustin is that he, Dustin saw him as a prize at some point and that light has gone away in their relationship. And that scene really got me. But it reminded me of a bunch of different things. It reminded me of Cat Black, who's a great YouTuber, um, she did a video about polyamory and about how in polyamory or in like non-monogamous relationships that a lot of the time the black partner is not prioritized, not given the status of being the primary partner. And I found that to be very um, apt. Because I, 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 I am polyamorous and I have been in like some situations where it's been like I am one of the partners and there is like a, a hierarchy or semi-hierarchical relationship and there is a white primary. Feeling like a prize is something that I, uh, I hate to, like it's one of the things I struggle with talking about a lot of the time is that um, I'm a, I'm really am a romantic. I watched way too much Sailor Moon growing up so I really do believe in that. Usagi and Demi and shit. Um, and I believe in like really big romantic love, sensible and everything else like that. And I sometimes I feel like I have cheated myself out of that in a lot of ways because I'm trying to be pragmatic, you know, like don't don't say that you need all these things. Um, Lane Moore, who's a, a writer and a entertainer, has this book about, you know, how to be how to be alone. And it talks about how like situationships can be so exhausting because everyone feels like you have to be in one. And what if that's not what you want? And I realized, you know, in the last year that I really want to be a girlfriend. Uh, you know what I mean? I want to be like a primary, like even in a polyamory, I want to be, I want to come first as, as Lindsay Lohan said at one point. So often in love and romance, black women are expected to eternally compromise, but those compromises because of the political status of our bodies and our relationships can be turned against us. There's this really good podcast I've been listening to called Tea with Queen and Jay, and they talk about how easy it is for us to turn into gatekeepers of other black women 
because we're like, you shouldn't be doing that, you shouldn't be doing that, and we forget that everyone has to come into their own voice at some point. Everyone has to go on their own journey to figure out what they want, who they want, how they want things, and black women are so expected to be adults so young and to be so emotionally like ready to go so young and it it makes us love hungry love starved and love exhausted all in the same breath when you are a black person who is aware of the world who knows their history who knows the place that they occupy in the world you don't just look for partners for sex or for love or for comfort you're looking for someone who is fundamentally invested in your survival period and the more intersections you occupy the more important it is that the partner that you pick understands respects and also wants you to survive who who loves you and respects you who understands you you know for me i'm like you know I'm a black queer woman with major anxiety issues who's a giant ass nerd you know i don't need you to be perfect but like we can't have no colorism no transphobia no fat phobia no ableism like and that's hard for some to be some people out there of every race so all y'all be disappointed but like you know i'm also not religious so that's also a big thing because like you know if you're a church person i mean it's 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 not gonna work out that's why the the Megan and Harry stuff is so cute to me. Like, I know everyone's like, they're gonna get divorced. I'm like, why y'all so bitter? Why can't you let Megan Marco live? But, like, the fact that he genuinely is like, yeah, we're gonna give up this stuff because I would rather be with you than all those other stuff. It's like, man, some, some people don't even have a, someone who would give them the last chicken nugget. They would eat that nugget. Harry not gonna eat the nugget. He gonna give Megan the nugget. That's what I want. I want someone who will let me have the last nugget. And I also think it's important that we have media that talks about our pain, our anxieties, and our stress. But I don't... <sighs> I hate that like so what I love I saw Little Women I loved it I know I know but I love it I'm a sucker I love you know I love white women's drama um but there's a part where where Joe Sir Sharonid says I'm so lonely and I loved that scene and I wanted it to be I wanted a black woman to say that you know I wanted an expression of that loneliness that's not about her being broken it's not like that Tyler Perry melodrama but just like a genuine like I have my career I have a f but I want other things and it was hard because I feel like slave play almost did that but it did it while having a framing of slavery and I didn't like that ultimately I appreciate it it allowed me to have these feelings to come to terms with a lot of things that I hadn't really been able to put into words like it's hard to navigate being aware of everything when you're always surrounded by white people like even like I think about my friends groups and how they have changed so much like growing up in East New York mostly new black and Hispanic people went to high school almost everyone was like West Indian and black went to college majority white institution went to grad school was hanging out with West Indian and black people again you know I want to say when I heard my first job at Barnes and Nobles majority um immigrant brown black people um went to go work at Strand majority white people at my current job majority white people and it's like you're always I realized also that I really want black women to tell their own love stories and their own love tragedies I think that slave play has a lot to say I think that it did it had great moments but I feel like overall I just I was missing that female voice I was missing the lived experience of being a black woman it had just been about the black um gay the interracial gay couple um or any of the other interracial pairings i think it would have been stronger but i think that the absence of a black female voice and, and the thing about it too like yes black men can write black women vice versa but there is something specific in black womanhood that was just it was there but it was just not quite and i was missing that but it did give me a lot of food for thought it did give me a lot of feelings. I, I yelled at so many white people uh, that I knew uh, about slave play afterwards. I, I like I said, I bought four copies of the book. Um, it was interesting. I think it's difficult as well because it's so expensive and it was a limited show, so it's gone. I really hope there's a recording of it somewhere because I think that 
we need to take this stuff out of that sphere of elitism and bring it down to everyone else. Because I think if more black people could see it, we didn't really have a fuller conversation and have the dialogue, but I think that the dialogue is being encouraged. I think that Harris has been really great about recognizing how the subject matter is frustrating, how it can be very divisive. He's been very encouraging of, of, of valid criticism and I applaud him for that. And so if you like decide to pick it up on Amazon and try it out for yourself, I think that's a great way to do it. I think it's like $14. It's sold out now, but I, you know, I think it's a good investment. I do think that we're gonna have to start having a lot more conversations about these issues about black womanhood and softness, but I think that we're just gonna have to do it ourselves. Like I think that like right now why I love romance and romance authors so much is like there's so many great black female uh, romance authors who are just telling all these great stories about contemporary black women finding love with black men, Latina men, white men, Asian men. I'm just like, mazel tov, you know, want more, want more, um, you know, queer ones would love some women love women stuff up in there. You know, just putting it out there, putting it out there. It has encouraged me to keep going forward with my own book and the things that I decided to do with it. And it makes me more excited to share that with you, you know, in, in the coming year or so to be able to share my book with you because it does take place during the Jim Crow era. And it, it reminded me of why I started making certain changes to the book and why I think it's so important that you show black women having authentic joy, authentic sadness, and authentic love. So, those are my complicated, long-winded thoughts about slave play. Highly recommend um, for Harriet's video on it. And if you have seen it, I'd love to hear your thoughts. And I'll link to the Amazon where you could order it if you'd like. And, yeah. That was it.